I've been helping people realize their dreams all my life. You see, I'm a film producer. Now at last I'm going to realize one of my own. I have an old converted tug called Regina, and together we're going to drift through Burgundy. Before I set out for Burgundy, I thought it was simply a geographical area which produced some good wine. I had no idea I would find such a Pandora's box of pleasures. The people I met in Burgundy were fiercely proud of what they did and delighted to show me their skills. To have a profession or a métier gives you real status in France. To be a good baker, butcher or pastry cook really means something. As the Regina and I made our way up the beautiful river Yon to the gateway to Burgundy, or as the French would have it, La Bourgogne, I started to get excited. My first stop was to do some rather unusual shopping in the normally sleepy little town of Aeon. Once a year for a day, the place is transformed into an enormous flea market. Here is a fine example of a four-cheek family bisou. This red barlet is something I want but don't need. Some of these items are very rare. How many times have you come across knife and fork mold? Military enthusiasts are unfortunately everywhere. I wonder who'll buy this red hat temptress. This pert little person sucking her straw is exactly the image I had of French girls in my youth. There's always a craze for some item or another. Aeon Market seems to have an enormous number of dolls, teddy bears and night soil buckets for some reason. I bet he's seen it all before. I vowed to myself I wouldn't be tempted and I'd come away with only one item. I bought a six pound sledgehammer, which will come in very handy. Hitting the nail on the head is not as easy as it looks. Many years ago, I glimpsed Auxerre from a car window as I sped past on the freeway. I vowed I would come here one day. I'm glad I did. Auxerre is one of the few towns in the world that's been made a saint. It has at least 32 churches, but it probably had a lot more in the Middle Ages when it was beatified. Behind me stands the great Cathedral of Saint Etienne. There's been a cathedral on that spot for at least a thousand years. This version was just about finished when Joan of Arc passed through on her way to meet the British and our horrible end. Auxerre is a prosperous town built on soft, porous rock, which means everyone has at least one cellar below their house. It also means there's a network of secret tunnels connecting the various religious communities to the church of their choice. Burgundy is a mass of details like this gentleman relieving himself. Bread is vital to the French. Going to get it is as important as jogging in New York or doing stairs in Los Angeles. I took some time to understand Auxerre's famous clock. It's normal time on this face and moon time on this face. That's 28 days a month. Imagine what these old stones have witnessed. It wasn't only the aristocrats who had their heads chopped off in the revolution. All these stone kings and queens got topped at the same time. I went to see Michelin Durand, head of the splendid Auxerre Museum, 
and asked her about Auxerre's legendary prosperity. She told me there were two reasons. The first is the river. Most of the wood that Paris needed was rafted down it. And the second is the wine. Auxerre was surrounded by vineyards, but disease destroyed the vines at the end of the 19th century. This is the last survivor. Part of Michelin's museum is the tomb of Saint-Germain, one of the founders of the Christian church. Thousands upon thousands of pilgrims have filed past this tomb, rubbing a bit of fabric against the casket for good luck. Nowadays, it's a peaceful place, ideal for a moment or two of quiet contemplation. Below the cathedral, I visited Claude Michel, a romantic demolition man. He was given the job of demolishing this ochre factory, but soon after he started tearing it down, he fell in love with the place and bought it. The factory sold ochre, the colored earth that people used to make paints with years ago. It's mined far under the ground near Auxerre, where the best ochre came from. This wall, for instance, was painted with ochre. All the great frescoes of the Middle Ages were painted with ochre. These days, Claude sells bits of the buildings he demolishes. I bet these bars have a tale or two to tell. The famous American film director, Billy Wilder, was asked by his wife to bring one of these bidets back from Paris. He declined and told her to try standing on her head in the shower. I was flattered when at the end of our tour, Claude took me to his Holy of Holies, a cellar he'd built with old stones and carvings he'd recovered from the buildings he'd demolished. Claude said he'd found these photographs of generous turn-of-the-century beauties in a cellar he'd taken apart. There's a proverb in French, to live well, live hidden. Everywhere you go in France, there seems to be a couple of lovers or a pretty girl on a banknote. The French have a passion for beautiful women, and I suspect that's why there are so many in France. The French are sports crazy. Saturday lunchtime is the time to study form and make a few well-considered investments on the horses. Another French passion is le foot, and then there's baby foot. Even girls play football in bars in France. I was rooting for her, but her brother beat her. Before le foot, after le foot. In Auxerre on Sunday afternoons, they still have ganguettes. When Henry Miller, the great American writer, came here, he said he thought Auxerre was more French than Paris. I wonder if this is what Henry Miller thought was French. With a glass of pastis in my hand, I watched the oldest swinger in town strut his stuff to the local accordion band. Maybe it was the pastis, but I came to the conclusion that, like Miller, I loved Auxerre. The time came for me to leave Auxerre and set off on my journey into the belly of Burgundy. The canal that winds its way through Burgundy is one of the most beautiful in France. For years, I've been inflicting my passion for the French waterways on my children. Now I was delighted that my granddaughter Ottilie had come to see me and give me a hand for a few days. For a girl who's into books, she's really good on the boat. Whilst Ottilie was at the wheel, a party of gondoliers steered skillfully past us. It was nice to see the Golden Lion of Venice on their flag so far from home. Four miles an hour is my top speed on the canal. 
all the better for drifting past pesticide-free fields of poppies. In summertime, all sorts of people fetch up in Burgundy. These two Japanese girls gave me a hand in return for a ride. Sentinel herons never vary their routine. When the boat gets within 20 meters, they're off. It wasn't long before I found myself watching the sunset in paradise. A foggy dawn promised a glorious day. Burgundy seemed to be fertile and sparkling everywhere when I arrived for my audience with the snail queen Natalie and her subjects. Here they are, about a week old. She starts off with about 750,000 of these little chaps and finishes up with 350,000 after the local predators have finished with them. And gradually they get bigger and bigger until they're old enough to have a place of their own after about three months. <laughs> when they get to this size, they're good to eat. Watching Natalie with her snails and her little boy, I thought she could have probably made anything grow in this wonderful place. <laughs> she told me the snail's sexual equipment is in the side of its head. Here you can't see it because these snails aren't fully developed. Snails are hermaphrodites. When they couple, they're both male. And when they're done, they both become female. They seduce each other, they hug and kiss and stroke each other with their horns. This genital orifice hides a spike of the same material the shells are made of. The snails excite each other with these spikes and at the height of their passion, the spikes break off. They couple for 12 hours. The snails in the wild go on for 24 hours. After that, they're completely exhausted and take a day to recover. I'm not at all surprised. She told me she starved them for 14 days and then she kills them. She cooks them in white wine, carrots and garlic and pops them in the jars. I bought a couple of jars, but I felt I needed an expert to cook them. My audience with the snail queen over, I left her to her subjects. Deep in the heart of burgeoning Burgundy, I found this farm that also has a restaurant. Tomorrow's lunch is everywhere. The gratin potatoes were so delicious that I asked the woman who ran the all-female kitchen to tell me how she made them. She said to cut them into thin slices, cook them in milk and water with a bit of salt. You cover the bottom of the dish with garlic, put a layer of potatoes over that and then a layer of cream and then some grated gruyere. You go on doing this till the dish is full, finishing with a layer of gruyere. 40 minutes in the oven should do it, and then 15 seconds under the grill. This definitely rates a pity bisou de Bourgogne. One morning I had a craving for some chocolate, so I mounted my faithful mobilette and set out for the medieval town of Semur. One of the distinguishing signs of Burgundy are the colored varnished tiles that they have on their roofs and towers. I went straight to Bruno Kerr, a young chocolate maker who's been trained in England and America. So this is the specialty of the town, uh, Sommurette. You can find it in a wooden box or in a little packet. Uh, this is a kind of chocolate, a mixture of chocolate. Uh, the mark is deposited since uh, 1920. Do you think I could have one? Yes. Do you, think you I want could, it? Do you think I could just try one? Mmm. Very good. Thank you. 
this cake has been created in the beginning of the century and uh, it's made of almond sugar, uh, eggs, egg yolks, egg white, and cooked for two hours. It's very uh, fluffy inside and you can keep it for about eight days. Is there a special secret to it? Yes, otherwise you would find it uh, everywhere. Oh, I see. And you won't. <laughs> You've got lots of secrets <laughs> That's here. why I said a lot. Uh, you've got lots of secrets here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does your wife know them? Sorry? Does your wife know them? No. You Nobody haven't knows. told her? No. Nobody knows. I don't trust her. <laughs> <laughs> I moored up right in the middle of Burgundy where Mr. and Mrs. Duru had promised to make me a famous local dish, Boeuf Bourguignon. Madame Duru uses a drop of oil, a kilo of good stewing steak, a bottle of cheap Burgundy, an onion, a couple of carrots and tomatoes, Madeira, a spoonful of flour, salt and pepper. Madame de Roux doesn't slice her onions, she simply cuts them in half. While the meat and onions are cooking, she scrapes her carrots and adds her flour. Then she pours in the whole bottle of the local red. Finally, a good dose of Madeira. Into a nice hot oven it goes for an hour. After an aperitif of Chablis and sausage, we settled down to the main dish. They confided that the secret was getting really good meat in the first place. It's quite wonderful and surprisingly simple. Three kisses for Madame Duru. I have a passion for collecting wild mushrooms, so I was delighted to find a specialist in the Morval, a wild and wooded area of Bergen. We have got today many, uh, many marshals, many Girol, from, from uh, in this region. Chanterelle, aren't Chanterelle, yes, there is uh, several uh, names. Will you be cooking some later? Oh, yes, with pleasure. Alors, voici les... Before he cooks the mushrooms, he cuts them up and rinses them in lemon water. He separates the pleurots and the girol and fries them in olive oil in different pans. The girol take two minutes to cook and the pleurots one and a half minutes to one minute 45. It's very important to get the times right. The girol always get much smaller the longer you cook them. Next morning, the chef and I went mushroom hunting. He took his dog Napoleon with him, or rather, Napoleon took the chef with him. It soon became quite clear that Napoleon's idea about mushroom hunting were not the same as the chef's. The chef was doubtful about these. He was going to check them in a book when he got back to the hotel. The chef waxed lyrical about this one. He said it was quite delicious. Il a quelques jours en forêt, mais il est encore 
Il a encore, euh, je dirais, ça. This is the king of the mushrooms, the Sep. A real bisou de Bourgogne. Il est bien. C'est pareil, alors ça, c'est très rare. It's very rare to find Girol in a Sep forest. We found 15 different types of mushroom that morning. But don't go picking mushrooms unless you know what you're doing. I kept looking at the snail queen's escargots in their jars and wondering whether I had the courage to cook them. I had a great idea. I decided I'd pay a surprise visit to my barge friends. I knew Michel would have a recipe for them. Roger told me he had to repaint his barge because the paintwork always got damaged in the winter. He told me the wheat they were unloading from his barge was a special kind for the buns they eat at McDonald's. He brought it from Germany. The French wheat apparently has too much protein. Michelle has a lovely sunny kitchen on our barge. She cuts up a few mushrooms, melts some butter. Every Frenchman will tell you that a lot of garlic goes well with snails. Michelle empties a couple of jars of snails into her pan, souses them in wine, and then loads even more garlic and parsley into the mix. Three good spoons of cream and the dish is nearly done. She had one good tip, never cover a dish with cream in it. Don't ask me why, but I'm sure she's right. This was superb. I have to rate this a grand bisou de Bourgogne. Merci bien pour cuisiner. <laughs> Excellent. This little village called Brazé en Morvan is one of those countless villages that you drive through in France. Unremarkable in every way, you might think. But it was here I discovered one of France's best kept and most delightful secrets. Pierre Michaud, known to everyone for miles around as Pepette, started baking here when he was 14. He's been at it ever since. His wife, Jeanette, works alongside him, emptying the hot coals from the oven. His dough is made from 50 kilos of flour, 40 liters of water, and 800 grams of salt, plus a packet of baker's yeast. He seems to weigh the dough for each loaf by eye. Peggy the pig lives right next to the bakery. She eats up all the bread they can't sell. Nothing is thrown away. Pepette kneads and rolls his baguettes with economical movements. Not an ounce of energy is wasted. Then he puts the rolled baguette into the oil cloth to rise. Pepet's grandfather installed this wood-burning oven over a hundred years ago. Avec, uh, avec uh, what's, what's there? Avec père, I asked him how he'd started, and he said with his father and brothers in 1943. I said I thought his customers were extraordinary. Mais votre client, c'est... Because they're so very punctual every day. Last of all, Pepette bakes free petit pain for the children. Baking is a real art in this part of the world because all his customers like their bread cooked differently. Some like it well done. Some like it underdone. He knows all our whims. All the bread has to be ordered, and Jeanette knows exactly who gets what. It's no good turning up if you haven't ordered anything. Yeah. Oh.
Voilà. Les hommes, c'est très gentil. The pet will be retiring soon. It'll be the end of an era, and after that, all our bread will be made at one of these places. I'm glad I had the chance to taste the real thing. The celebration. <laughs> Burgundy is so rich and varied. I feel I've only just scratched the surface. <laughs>